When uh, historians look back at a time where art and science and culture took great leaps forward, the Italian Renaissance often ranks high on the list. The 15th century was crowded with brilliant thinkers and artisans, names like Michelangelo, Raphael, and Botticello. These are all works who are still acclaimed even today. And amid the eras, artistic giants stood none taller than Leonardo da Vinci. His accomplishments are staggering. He achieved master status by age 22. He revolutionized the medium's techniques and painted some of the most recognizable artworks in history. Even those who know nothing about art, art can name the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper paintings. And that's just one page of his resume. Leonardo had an insatiable appetite for work. His mind could barely contain the hundreds of ideas that continually poured forth. His innovations reached far beyond his sizable achievements as a painter. He journaled feverishly. And in the thousands of pages that survived, we see evidence of a man obsessed with anything and everything. Math, geology, and anatomy, and engineering, philosophy, botany, architecture, warfare, zoology, light, energy, you name it, he thought about it. His journal entries included intricate sketches of futuristic inventions, his schematics for vehicles, helicopters, medical devices, and optics were centuries ahead of their time. He could simultaneously draw with one hand while writing with the other, and his diary is often mere images of that. It's unsure as to why he wrote this way. Maybe he just encoded his work, but he could do so with apparent ease. Though he was born a peasant, Leonardo's brilliance propelled him into elite company. The Duke of Milan treated him as an advisor and strategic partner. He was celebrated as Rome's most famous resident, hailed not only as a designer, but also as the city's official engineer, and most esteemed scientist. Though human dissection was outlawed at the time, the Pope gave Leonardo a personal dispensation to open cadavers and to study their anatomy. Toward the end of his career, the King of France gave him a free chateau and paid him simply to think. With a resume that spectacular, you could easily assume that the ultimate Renaissance man lived out his last days in France with an air of fulfillment. Gratified with a life well lived. Hardly. In fact, Leonardo saw himself as a failure. His standards were so high, his goal so lofty, that on his deathbed, Leonardo uttered these sad final words. Quote, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Wow. If Leonardo da Vinci's fell short of God's standards, what hope is there for the rest of us? The same lack of confidence that plagued Leonardo is rampant in our time. In school, on the playing field, in the office, or even at home, we strive to be the best, hoping to make a name for ourselves or affix a star to the family name. We scratch and claw to pull our waves ahead of our peers, only to glance back and realize we'll never outrun the nudging parent, the critical mentor, or that haunting voice that says we'll never be good enough. I don't know if you've heard that song before. One of the things I love about the song is the honesty of that. Here's somebody who says, I have confidence in what I heard. You get to heaven through Jesus and forgiveness. But I also recognize there's a lack of alignment in my life. My habits, my temptations, my addictions. I am worried that I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to have whiskey on my breath. I'm going to not live the life I should have lived, that I wasn't in alignment with him. We're going to talk today in Jesus' end quote about something the Bible offers very unique. Very unique from any other religion. Even unique from the religion of Christianity is the message of the Bible often. And that is that the Bible gives you a confidence that you can be forgiven, not just of what you did in the past, but you can be forgiven and accepted by God for the past, the present, and the future. How could you do that? Because what if you do something wrong after you ask Christ into your life or you you become a follower of him? Well, because your acceptance before God, the Bible says, is not based on what you do, but based on what he did. Which immediately gets an objection. Well, yeah, yeah, you've got to forgive me of everything, past, present, future. What's going to keep me from obeying anymore? I'm just going to go live however I want. As if if you take the fear away that suddenly there's no incentive to, to live in a right way. Well, if you take the fear away and you're no longer motivated to live, then probably fear was your primary motivation. 
The unique message of the Bible is that God's full forgiveness motivates you out of love to love him back. God's full forgiveness motivates you to go and forgive others as well. And the Bible's got this incredible hypothesis or thesis that those who've been forgiven much want to go and forgive much. For those who see how patient God has been with them want to go and be patient to others. And the more you understand the depth of God's forgiveness, the more you don't struggle with this idea of, well, if I am accepted before God and I need to clean myself up before God, but rather you look deeper into the fact that God cleaned you up, washed you up, forgave you fully for him. As we look at this final end quote that Jesus has, we head into to Easter. Jesus is going to say some words that reflect what we heard from Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, despite everything he did, he said, I've offended God, to which our modern sensibilities say, yeah, I don't like this idea that we've offended God. And yet Leonardo recognized, I have offended God by what I've done wrong, but I've also offended God because what I've done right wasn't up to his standards. He went on to say, I've offended mankind because the quality of my work wasn't good enough. And as long as you build your identity on the quality of your good works or bad works, you're going to come up short. The Bible says instead of building your works on what you've done well or haven't done wrong, build it on what God has done on your behalf. And that will be a firm foundation by which you can live from and build an identity from. And it will allow you to do things you didn't think possible, like forgive your enemies. Which is why our main point today and our main quote from Jesus is very much an antithesis to this. Because it says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There are three parts to this that give us the benefit of being able to forgive other people that we don't really even want to forgive. But we don't want to be wrestling with our own bitterness. Three parts. Father, the forgive them. And they know not what they do. Three parts to help us practice forgiveness in our own life. The first part is Father. Jesus says Father. It's a recognition of the relationship I share in common with my enemies. Because when I'm mad at somebody, when I feel betrayed by somebody, when I feel like somebody stabbed me in the back, I immediately withdraw from them, don't you? Emotionally I withdraw. Physically sometimes I withdraw. I don't hang out with them. I go different places for lunch. Whatever it is, I find a new way around the office. I avoid people who are, who are hurting me or I feel like have hurt me. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're more mature than I do. But I have a tendency to withdraw because I don't have anything in common with them. I would never have said that. I never would have done that. I wouldn't have that kind of attitude. I wouldn't raise my kids that way. It's a combination of hurt and sometimes just self-righteousness. I know I'm better than them and I don't want to hang out with those kind of people. This first phrase, Father, is a recognition that I actually share a lot in common with my debtors. I share a lot in common with my enemies. I share a lot in common with those who have trespassed against me. Look what it says. It says in the Bible that it was on that day that the criminals, go ahead and go to the next slide, there were two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And Jesus could easily say, I'm not like the criminals. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right side, the other on the left. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, that first word, Father, I think there's three aspects to it that jump off the page to me. The first one is, if you're having trouble forgiving your your enemies, or forgiving anyone for that matter, the first part of that is, Father, you're inviting God. God, I need your resources. My patience has run out. God, I need your compassion. I need your mercy. Mine has run out. God, I need access to a closeness with you. I need to get close with you, God. Understand your forgiveness of me so that I might have the capacity to give what you've given me to others. The second aspect of this word father is this idea that my debtors share a common creator with me. You ever thought about the people you're most angry at that God made them to? Because when I think about most people, I'm like, yeah, sure, God made everybody. And I guess theoretically I know he made my enemies, but I don't like the idea he made my enemies. And as you emotionally distance yourself from someone, that phrase father is a reminder that God is our common creator. And that God was the creator of the criminals. More than that, God was the creator of the Roman soldiers who were crucifying him. And so when you speak to God being your father... 
It's actually a reminder to change your perspective of those who've hurt you. Then the same way God wants to father you, he also wants to father them. And that actually changes your perspective from turning them into sort of polarizing black and white, all wrong, all wrong, into, oh, this is somebody God cares about too, even though I currently don't. The third aspect of this is the idea that it's a prayer. Jesus is praying, Father. Isn't that how he began his main prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God is beginning the process in the same way for you and I. If you want to learn how to forgive people you're having trouble forgiving, it usually starts with Father. God, I need your help. Father, I need to get close to you. Father, I need your perspective. Father, remind me that you love them and I shouldn't hate them. Talking to a friend, he said he had a coworker years ago who just drove him crazy. He said, if I was honest, I probably said I had hatred in my heart, but I wasn't honest, so I just said she annoyed me. And I, I, I took Jesus' words to heart. He said to pray for your enemies and to pray that God would bless those that you don't like. And I began to not only pray for this person, I began to pray blessings upon this person. I began to daily ask God to give me his heart for this person. He said, after the first day, you know what happened? Nothing. About a week, nothing. He said, but I noticed something. As I daily was praying for this person, instead of sort of regurgitating in my head all the annoyances I had, all the idiosyncrasies in my head, I found myself instead beginning to dwell on the fact that I wanted God to bless them. And several months into our working relationship, I found myself actually beginning to change my perspective toward this person because I've been praying for them. I got to the place where I'm not sure they're going to be my closest confidant, but instead of being annoyed, I truly befriended them, got to see them for their weaknesses, got to see them for some things that shaped them to who they were. This idea changed me. It's what happens when you begin to pray for the person you're angry at is God begins to change your heart toward that person, and you get actually free from bitterness and unforgiveness. Eric Lomax certainly knew that. Eric Lomax was a soldier, World War II and I think the year was 1942, and he had been captured by the Japanese. He had been captured, and particularly the man who was in charge of his POW camp was incredibly cruel. So much so that they were forced to build a 418-mile railway down to Burma. And for whatever reason, this particular soldier decided he was going to take it all out on Eric. Eric said he'd be beaten so badly there wasn't a square inch on his body that wasn't bruised. He was beaten so badly that one time he had over 900 times he was struck in a six-hour period of time, breaking his ribs and breaking his arms. And then for relief, he was shoved into a cage at night covered in his own excrement. He said it was brutal. When he escaped and returned home, and the war ended... He suffered from nightmares and PTSD. He lost relationships with his, his kids and others just because he didn't know how to relate to the world anymore. He even broke up a marriage. None of which he wanted, but he just all the ramifications of what this person did to him. It wasn't just what he did then, but it was the ramifications that came later. He remarried. His wife encouraged him to pursue forgiveness, to pursue God, to, to get free from all the anger and the bitterness, even the righteous anger that he had toward this. He's in his 80s, and he read a book. In this book, it told the story of a Japanese soldier who had great remorse over what he had done, and he had been trying to make things right since the war. And he particularly said, there was one particular prisoner I had beat and beat and beat. I don't know what came over me. I, I, I wish I knew who he was. I wish I could make it right. As he's reading this book, he realized he is the soldier. He is the prisoner the soldier is speaking of. And he decides he's going to go and confront this guy and get revenge on this guy. And here's what he says. Eric Lomax set out almost 50 years after the war to meet Nakashi Nagasi. His heart filled with utter loathing and hate. When we met, Nagasi greeted me with a formal bow, and I took his hand. Just the idea of taking the hand of your enemy. And something changed, he said. So much so that instead of all that anger spewing out, the first thing that came out of his mouth was, Good morning, Mr. Ngasi, how are you? He was trembling and crying as he said over and over and over again, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. 
I am so sorry. And all I could get out of my mouth was at least we both survived. And that beginning step formed a relationship of forgiveness and freedom that the two of them eventually became friends and they traveled the world speaking about the power of forgiving your enemies. Even Leonardo da Vinci, as he was painting his famous The Last Supper, he was having trouble getting the face of Jesus right. And he really wanted Jesus' face to be bright, to be fully drawn into who Jesus was. As the story goes, as he was journaling, he, he couldn't get the, after multiple attempts, Jesus' face right. So instead what he did is he went back, and as he was journaling, he realized that he was holding a grudge. You see, before painting Jesus' face, he painted Thomas's. And he had a particular arch enemy there in Italy that he couldn't stand. And he thought, you know what, I want to take the face of my enemy and paint him under the face of, of, of evil Judas, or, or Thomas rather. And so what he did is he wanted the face of the doubter, the face of the enemy, to be the face of his enemy. And as he painted the face of his enemy onto the face of this disciple, he realized that he could not capture the essence of who Jesus was as long as he had painted his real-life enemy into the, the painting. So he erased the painting of Thomas, repainted into just a not somebody he knew. He said something in that freed him up to be able to paint the face of Jesus to what we see today in the Last Supper. By forgiving his enemy, he was able to have a better encounter with God. And sometimes it's a, a chicken and the egg. Sometimes an encounter with God lets you forgive your enemies. And sometimes the more you're able to forgive your enemies, the more you're able to see God. And wherever you are in that cycle, God says, jump in. That's that first step. Father, recognize a common relationship I have between myself and my enemies. The second thing is this. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Father, I want you to forgive them. I want you to do it. I can't do it. I'm going to hand justice over to you. Who's the them? Remember, there's two criminals here. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, so they is not only the criminals, they is also the people who have crucified him. And when they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. He's looking out all through time to everyone, but specifically in that paragraph, he's saying, I want to forgive the people pounding the nails into my wrists, into my feet. Forgive them. This again, what's so unique about the Bible, because when I look at criminals, I go, sure, sure, we all struggle with stuff, but I don't need to forgive them what a criminal needs to be forgiven. Sure, 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 sure. I got some things I don't live up to my own standards, blah, 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 blah. But I'm not one of the, the soldiers crucifying Jesus. And what happens is that produces a self-righteousness in you. And that's actually the biggest problem with forgiving your enemies is because the more you think you're not them, the more you go, I could never forgive that, them, what they did, because I would never do that. And the more you do that, the more your pride and your arrogance keeps you from forgiving people because you're so above them. You're not in as need as much forgiveness as they are. Which is why whether you believe the Bible's message or not, it is so deeply humbling because what the Bible comes to you and says is that you are them. I am them. That what is in the heart of the criminal, what is in the heart of Adolf Hitler, what is in the heart of the Roman soldier is also in me. No, I'm not like them. That the seeds of arrogance, the seeds of deceit, the seeds of addiction, the seeds of, of all those seeds are in me. And I am the one who put Jesus on the cross. And whether you believe that or not, if you believe that, do you see how humbling that would be that God forgave me for crucifying His Son? And if that's true, that I am they, I am them, then I can forgive other people what God's forgiven me. You see, when I realize I am them, I realize I'm not Him. I'm no longer capable of being the judge. And I'm going to push justice off to God because He can forgive. He can decide. He can be impartial. I can't. I'm as in need of forgiveness as my enemies. One of my favorite verses, I've referenced it twice in the last month. It's changed my life. I've memorized it multiple times. I go back to it and sort of re-put it into my mind. It's really from First Peter. It tells us how Jesus did it. How did He forgive His enemies? It says that when He was reviled, He did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. How? How did he do it? 
Here's how he did. He continued on and on, minute by minute, second by second. He continued entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus on the cross with all the pain and all the agony. And he moment by moment said, God, I'm giving justice over to you. God, I'm giving judgment over to you. God, I'm not going to take the role here of judge. I'm going to not revile and return. I'm not going to threaten. I'm going to hand justice over to you. And sometimes if you're angry, and I've had folks I'm angry at or hurt at or people who betrayed me who don't realize it and people who did it maliciously. And there are times that it wasn't saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do once. It was like a minute by minute exercise. God, I want to continually, one more time, scrape off some more bitterness, God. And I think I'm free. And then about a month later, it comes back up. More that venom comes to the top. God scrapes off some more. God, I'm going to entrust this to you again. I'm going to entrust this to you again. That's why in Christianity, though there's lots of philosophy and there's lots of history and there's lots of dogma to Christianity, ultimately what Christianity is really about, the focal point of Christianity, is Jesus. He is the main thing. His character, his work, his death, his resurrection. But look at what he could do while he is being crucified. He's forgiving his enemies and he says, you and I are his enemies. And he was willing to forgive us. He said, I don't believe God thinks anybody's an enemy. Well, that doesn't make God any more loving. When you realize that you were God's enemy and he was willing to reconcile with you, that's more loving than I think is we're all fine. When you recognize you were an enemy of God and he wanted to reconcile with you, you discover how loving and forgiving God is. Jesus is the focal point of forgiveness and of history. So Leonardo da Vinci was uh, completing his, his painting of the Last Supper, and he took one of the early drafts and he brought it to a friend of his. And he said, what do you see? What do you like about this? What speaks to you about this? And his friend was looking at the painting and he goes, oh, it's masterful. That cup you have on the table is worthy of our Lord. The way you painted it, the way it captures the light, the way it... And Leonardo's getting angry. The cup? I paint this painting to draw your attention to Jesus, and you're looking at the cup? He came home that evening, he painted the cup out of the picture. There's no cup there anymore. Because he didn't want the cup to get in the way. And you might have something getting in the way of your message to Jesus. I'm not sure about the philosophy here, or the problem of evil, the age of the earth, or whatever it is. Lots of stuff. Don't miss out on the main thing. As you're on your spiritual journey, make the focal point Jesus. To study Him, get to know Him. Just read the Bible, whether you believe it or not, and go, wow, wouldn't you want a friend like that? Wouldn't you want to know somebody like He gets mad at the right times. He gets compassionate at the right times. He's such a unique combination of things that don't exist in one human being. It's, it's as if it's God in the flesh. And He was able to hand justice over to God. Father, I have a common relationship with my debtors. Forgive them. I'm handing justice of God over to you to forgive them. And thirdly, they know not what they do. There's two parts to this I think are very helpful if you want to learn how to forgive. Jesus references two pieces here. They know not what they do. The first thing you do if you want to forgive somebody is you see what they do. You don't minimize it. Well, they didn't really hurt me. No, you see what they do. And sometimes that takes some courage. Yes, it was incredibly insensitive what they did. That was incredibly cruel, those words. The neglect of a parent, the abuse of a friend. So part of forgiving means coming face to face courageously by seeing what they do or they did. Feeling that betrayal, feeling that pain, feeling that remorse, feeling that hurt. The other part, though, that we bring to bear when we forgive is not just seeing what they do, but seeing what they don't. Jesus is able to see what they do, but they do not know what they do, but he also saw what they do not know. Two parts here. I see what they do, and I see what they don't see. Which allows me to come to my father or my mother and say, you know, they did the best they can. And yeah, they made some mistakes. I saw what they did, and it was not really helpful. In fact, it was very hurtful. But I also see the fact they're just trying to get by. I see what they do and I see what they don't see that they did. And this allows you to see your enemies as human beings. 
to see them as broken, to give them mercy, to give them grace. And you're only, I'm only able to do that if I realize that God's given me grace and given me benefit. I'm only able to do that because I recognize that God sees what I do, but also sees what I don't see that I can't see. I'll give you an example. About a year ago, there was an article going on Facebook, true story, about a, a girl. A 17-year-old girl was in school, and she... At the end of school one day, she decides she and a boyfriend, apparently, as, as the story came out initially, uh, went and had sex in the bathroom. So much so he invited the entire uh, sports team he was on, and she ends up sleeping with all of them, just about every kid in that class by the end of the day during that seven-hour period of time. As the article was passed around the Internet, <clears throat> the comment list was Amazing. What kind of parents? What kind of girl? I would never, I can't believe, this is ridiculous. Just demonizing this girl, attacking this girl, attacking the parents, everybody's self-righteousness just spewed through the comments. Till the next day the follow-up article came. This girl had been a sex victim, abducted and held for three years, and this was her first day back in public school. And suddenly didn't the whole story change? doesn't mean that that was a healthy thing, doesn't mean that was a good thing, but suddenly the perpetrator became the victim. All of a sudden you brought compassion into the story, didn't you? Oh, oh, after what, who could imagine what had happened to her in three years? To say, oh, imagine if you could look at your enemies and see what they do, and it's terrible, but also see the perspective by which what they don't know that they're doing but they don't realize how broken they are, how, the, how they grow up, what, what happened to them, the, the, the ways in which they don't understand it. I had this, I shared with you, and I apparently forgot to tell the end of the story, so this is my chance to tell the end of the story. Um, and I was trying to forgive, you know, just people who have wronged or hurt or at least made our life more complicated. I mentioned well, about four months ago that you know, one of my neighbors turned my wife and I into DCFS for how we were treating our son. And so the DCFS officer shows up and you know, says, I heard you're not feeding your son. And my wife, I literally burst out laughing. He eats about every 15 minutes. And, and so uh, I officially have my DCFS letter that says I'm a good parent. So that's the part I didn't tell you. So I, ooh, I did pass the test. But the frustration, the embarrassment, the, but, but don't tell anybody, by the way. It's very embarrassing that this happened to me. So just keep this between us. Um, but I remember in the moment, very frustrating, very angering, and very like, you've got to be kidding. If everything else we're trying to do... All the adaptations we're making, and we get this hassle. And I did the same thing. You know, as I was feeling those feelings of anger or hatred or whatever you want to call it, probably a little bit of everything, I had to both go, look what they did, and then what did, I had to see what they did and also see what they can't see. You know, they were just trying to protect my little guy. They don't know. They don't know that he eats bugs because he has a condition that he eats bugs. And he doesn't know that we have worked with medical professionals to try and tell him that to eat bugs. And they pretty much said, you know what, he's enjoying eating bugs. Honestly, most cultures in the world eat bugs. Of all things you're dealing with, don't worry about him eating bugs. But I'm now imagining if, if I'm a neighbor and I see my son eating bugs in the backyard, I might come to the conclusion they don't feed him. Versus he enjoys this. This is fun for him. And what that allowed me to do is not realize it wasn't a hassle, it wasn't frustrating, it wasn't annoying, it wasn't embarrassing, it wasn't unjust. Those things were still true. But I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give my enemies, or even not my enemies, I'm going to give those who've hurt me or have complicated my life the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to realize that what they see and what they also don't see. I'm reading a, a book called Because We Love. It talks about the ways in which we grow up and how our family systems create ways in which we're not able to connect with our spouses in the best way we, that we could. His wife and husband were on their way to start heading toward divorce and things were not going well. And he began to share a story in counseling that day that his counselor asked him to share in a little more detail where he spoke about no matter what he did with his father, it was never good enough, never good enough, never good enough. And, and where some people, never good enough makes you really driven because you're going to eventually prove you can do it good enough. And others of us have that kind of pressure and we resort to, why even try? And he'd gotten to the place in their marriage, he's, why even try? I can never listen well enough. I can never interact well enough. I can never give you whatever it is you want, so I've given up. And she had sort of checked out of the marriage, but as she began to hear this story of her husband, she began to still annoyed that he wasn't listening well, still annoyed that he wasn't able to communicate as well, but she brought some compassion into that to go, oh, now I understand why this is hard for you. Because in marriage, the things that are easy for you 
are really hard for your spouse. But it's not hard for you, right? Because it's you. It just comes natural to you. And, and then you wonder why you don't get enough credit for the hard work you do because that's something that's easy for your spouse and vice versa. But when you're able to see your spouse or see your kids and understand their story, you're able to see what they do wrong but also begin to see what they don't see, what might be a weakness or a handicap or a disability or an or a undeveloped perspective of their life. And that brings some some grace and some forgiveness and some salve into a heart that's growing hard. We see what they do and we also see what they don't do. Take Leonardo da Vinci, for example, The Last Supper. Again, this painting, amazing painting has inspired people throughout history, right? People say, when I think of Jesus, when I think of The Last Supper, this is what I picture in my head. This is such an amazing piece of art. And yet, did you know just about every aspect of this painting is historically wrong? He's a 4th century Italian painter trying to depict a Middle Eastern event that happened around 30 A.D. Jesus, a Jewish rabbi with 12 Jewish disciples, and you can see that captured so well on the top left. Look at those wonderful Middle Eastern Jewish disciples. You know, the white Caucasian Europeans. Huh. And of course, any practice practicing Jew knows that Passover always occurs at evening. You have the Passover meal at evening. As you look out the window, clearly it's nighttime, it's dark, you can see the... Oh, no, no, he got the date wrong too. And of course, as a Jewish rabbi, one of the most important things about celebrating the Last Supper, which was the Jewish festival of Passover, was having a kosher meal, which meant one of the main things about Passover is to have unleavened bread, which of course we look and we see the big loaves of bread, fully leavened, fully grown there in the corner. And if you study history, you'll know that in 14th century Italy, one of the most popular things to eat was eel. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci loved eating eel. So much so, he assumed Jesus loved eating eel, even though it was considered an unclean uh, animal in the Jewish tradition. And so here we see, sitting on the plate, some unkosher eel next to some citrus next to the unkosher bread. Now, does that mean that everything about this painting is wrong, that we shouldn't have been inspired by it, there's nothing to see here? No. But we recognize what he did right, beautiful painting, depicting many things that have inspired people. But we also see what he didn't know. As a 14th century Italian, he wasn't real up to speed on Jewish traditions. We bring that same perspective to our, those we need to forgive. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. What I'd like to encourage you to do is take each of these three steps and apply it to someone specific in your life. And it might be that person that you have been saying, telling that story about for the last five years, ten years. Everybody's like so sick of hearing the story, but you can't get free of the story because of what they said or didn't do. It's your mom, it's your dad, it's that business partner stabbing you in the back, it's your ex-wife, it's your ex-husband. I want to encourage you to get free between now and Easter. By simply putting that person's name in the blank and praying this every day for at least a week. If it doesn't work by then, keep going till Easter. (laughs) Father, forgive my dad. For he did not fully know what he was doing. Father, forgive my son. For when he disowned me, he didn't really know what he was doing or how it would hurt me. Father, forgive my business partner for he or she did not fully, he knew some parts, (laughs) did not fully, I want to see what he, he did, but also see what he didn't know that he did. And I want you to just test and see if Jesus' hypothesis is true when you pray for your enemies and ask God's perspective for your enemies, it doesn't change your heart and mind. In fact, I would give you a chance to hear a real story of someone who's been through that very process. Those who realize that when you've been forgiven much, you can forgive much much as well. So can you give a warm horizon welcome to my friend, Cy. Cy, come on up. Thanks for being here today, Cy. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning. My name is Cy Pittstick, and I'm here to share a little bit about forgiveness. So I remember vividly when my wife forgave me for being such a lousy husband the first two years we were married. I remember feeling freed 
I felt so relieved when she forgave me. That was 20 years ago. You know, I grew up in a good family, normal home, grew up in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, my parents modeled a phenomenal, loving marriage. In fact, they've been married for over 50 years, and they still continue to, to model a loving marriage. And, you know, my, my family defines success as being successful in business, having a strong marriage, and having a strong family. And I, I really wanted that as a young man. I wanted to have those things. And so I worked really hard in college and high school and got out into the working world, moved to Cincinnati, uh, got into the commercial real estate business, and was on straight commission. And it was really hard. But I, I worked hard. I sacrificed. Uh, in fact, I put a lot of things on the, on the back burner because uh, my, my career demanded it. And a lot of things suffered. But through hard work, it, Things started to turn out after the first five years and uh, started to meet my income goals, started to get some awards at work, and things looked like they were turning out. And uh, it was interesting, even though my career was going well, uh, I, I had this nagging thought inside that something was, was not quite right, that things were something was missing. This couldn't be the meaning of life for me. And it was about this time that uh, I'm, I married my beautiful wife, Laura, and you know, we really looked like the perfect couple. My career was going well, had a beautiful wife. We lived in our first condo in, in Hyde Park. Things looked great on the outside, the American dream. But I'll tell you, behind closed doors, things were not going well. Uh, during our first year of marriage, I was a hard guy to get along with. I was demanding. I was demanding on myself. I was demanding on Laura. I expected a lot out of her. I was, had a horrible temper. And uh, we would just, just have knockdown, drag-out fights, through our first year, year and a half of marriage, and it was terrible. In fact, you know, divorce became a common theme in our household. So in 1993, I moved to a new company, and I was still doing the same thing, and my boss invited me, the president of the company invited me to a mayor's prayer breakfast. And i got to tell you, I had no interest in going and praying with the mayor. In fact, I had no idea what that even meant. Uh, I will tell you that... Uh, when I went there, there was a guy uh, that spoke that gave his life story. His name was Chuck Colson, and uh, he talked about his life, and it, it just it just resonated with me the way that he was striving to get ahead in business, how he had broken some relationships along the way, and I was like riveted in my chair. I felt like I was the only guy in the room. And then he then when he came to the to the uh, pinnacle of the story, he said that his life changed because he had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And i gotta, I got to stop here and tell you that I'd only been to church probably five or six times in my entire life. We did not go to church growing up. I, I went for weddings and funerals, and that was about it. But I will tell you that I had enough pain in my life, and I was confused about what my purpose was in life. But I said, you know what? I need to do something. I need to learn more about what this guy had to say. And they gave me the opportunity to join a, a six-week beginner Bible study. And so, uh, so I signed myself up for that, which, which was pretty uncharacteristic of me to do. And then uh, they said it was down at the Queen City Club. And I, I got to tell you, I almost didn't go because I was like, I'm not going to go to this Bible study. But uh, I was like, well, the Queen City Club is pretty nice. And uh, I know uh, I, maybe I can meet some commercial real estate prospects down there. So I went for all the wrong reasons, but uh, it was interesting because some Christian businessmen came around me and some couples came around, Laura and I, and after this uh, six-week Bible study, it turned into a longer study, and uh, they began to teach us about what the Bible had to say about marriage and about some of the things that Chad spoke about today, and I, I found out that I was separated from God. You know, my self-centeredness, my pride, my ego... My lust, my anger, I mean, the list can just go on and on. This separated me from God. It broke my relationship between me and God. And, you know, the, the Bible has a word for this that I learned. It was called sin. And I, I really didn't like this word, but I, somebody told me that sin actually is an archery word that means missing the mark. So I, I, I like missing the mark better than sin. But uh, it's interesting that, I, that, you know, it's the same issues that was, was, was separating me from my wife. And, you know, I really wanted to be a good husband. I mean, I did not come home at night wanting to be a, a bad guy, but I would come home and I just could not seem to fix myself. Uh, I wanted to fix our marriage, but no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't do it. It was so frustrating. Well, over time, it became crystal clear to me that these issues were at the core of my broken relationships. 
And as I was learning more about God, I learned about how much he loved me and how much he loved people and then how much he loved relationships. And that's why he hated sin so much was because it broke relationships. In fact, the penalty in the Bible I learned, which was shocking to me, but the, the penalty is death. Not just death, but eternal separation from God. But the most, the beautiful thing that's in Scripture is that it says that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to pay that penalty for me. That I could be 100% forgiven, past, present, and future. That was incredible. So after about three years of beating my head against a wall and trying to fix my problems, fix my own marriage, I finally just said, I can't do it. And so I got down on my hands and knees in 1996 and asked Jesus Christ into my life. And nothing happened that day. But I will tell you that over time, God supernaturally took my temper away, completely took my temper away. God also started to help me be a nicer guy in our relationship. And instead of putting work in the front seat and Laura in the back seat, I started to put Laura first. And things begin to change. And Laura took notice of that, too. And she also uh, went on a spiritual journey and, and had Christ come into her life. And it was at this time that Laura actually was truly able to forgive me. And it was this true forgiveness that actually allowed our marriage to heal. And I don't want you to think that, you know, things have been, you know, rosy ever since then because, you know, life has a way of uh, putting you through ups and downs. And uh, I will tell you that Laura and I have had our, our own share of problems. But the fact is we have experienced God's forgiveness, and then we've been able to provide that forgiveness to one another when things aren't going well. And we've actually been able to provide that forgiveness for other people in our lives, including our, 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 our family members and, and our children. And it's interesting because before Chad even asked me to do this, uh, uh, I had written a Valentine's Day to, to Laura just about a month ago. And this will just summarize what forgiveness has done for us. It says, uh, Laura, I am so thankful that God has continued to nurture and bless our marriage. This is the marriage I dreamed about 20 years ago. I'm so happy to be with you. Love, Cy. Thank you very much. Oh, I think Sai communicated well that uh, in order to forgive much, you need to be forgiven much. And so maybe this morning you say, well, I, I'm not there yet, or I want to be there, but I need the power to do it. Let me just lead you in a quick prayer. And it can be simple. It's nothing magic about the words, but it's really saying, God, I invite you to forgive me. Help me understand how much I've been forgiven. And then I want you to empower me to forgive the people in my life. You just follow along something like this in your own heart. Say, God... Help me see how much you've forgiven me. Thank you that you came to earth to forgive my wrongdoing, the way in which I, the way in which I miss the mark. God, give me the power to forgive others. The people I like, and the people I right now don't. Father, fill me with your patience, with your love, and with your forgiveness. Father, we thank you for each person here. We know for some the, the debt and trespass before them is, is, is huge. And God, only a work of your grace could bring them freedom from, from bitterness. So God, we ask that as we go forth today, we'll go forth in your power and your might and your forgiveness, that we'd be freer people. Thank you for this final quote you gave to us, Father. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we receive that as your quote to us, not just to those soldiers and criminals. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being here today. I will see you next week as we continue, end quotes, heading up to Easter. See you again.